Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Farhan Ferdows, co-founder and president of Volunteer Singapore. Nice to see all of you here today. Now, before I begin, um, I would just like to ask you a simple question. What do you make poverty to be? What does poverty mean to you? Well, poverty is defined as a condition of having little or no money. So now that we're clear about what poverty is, have you ever thought that if, if poverty exists in Singapore? Now, can I have a show of hands? How many of you here think that poverty exists in Singapore? Show of hands. Wow, I didn't expect this much. <laughs> okay, so a lot of you agree that poverty exists. Now, what if I told you that poverty in Singapore does not exist? This is something I know that many people think, but this is not true. It exists because we have a lot, about 60,000 poor people in Singapore, and this is according to information by the authorities. Well, I'm here today to debunk this myth. I want to create the awareness of the social problems in Singapore, including poverty, because many of us are unaware of the social issues and are oblivious to these social problems. Now, unless these social issues are made clear, it would be very difficult to rally people to give their time, support and money to help the unfortunate. My purpose is also to encourage and convince our youths, including all of you here today, to volunteer actively to help enhance and change the fate of our needy and the underprivileged in Singapore. Well, personally for me, the issue of poverty and social problems are quite clear. Um, as I was exposed to it, I was quite acquainted with it since uh, I was quite small. Um, because my dad was an active volunteer and usually he frequented many nursing homes and charities. Whenever he went, he would drag me along as well. Uh, would I say he would bring me along as well? So little did I know that my own personal encounter with poverty after experiencing it for myself would be the main reason for me to start Voluntary Singapore, to rally our youths to live a life of giving and to help the underprivileged. So I was first acquainted with poverty at the age of 12. Um, and that was when I was a young boy. So my dad brought me in on a fateful day um, to volunteer at a mosque. And this was during the uh, religious festival for the Muslims. It's called the Hari Raya Haji. Right? So Hari Raya Haji is basically a festival whereby the Muslims would um, slaughter, or would I say sacrifice, sheep and, and cows um, with the primary objective of donating majority of this meat to, to the needy, people who need um, you know, who, who need this help. So I started volunteering and, and, and it was quite an unconventional uh, volunteering activity for me because uh, I saw myself at the age of 12, much like these two kids here, right? I was wrestling sheep, right? Um, not your regular volunteering activity. I was corralling them, bringing them um, to the person who will be slaughtering them. Uh, I was a little bit like the angel of death, right? And then after which, um, I would be putting their carcasses on the wheelbarrow and bringing them to the various sections where they'll be, where the wool will come out and then they get their bodies chopped and all that. Now, I shouldn't go into the details, okay? We've got kids here, okay? So, but I think what I really enjoyed from, um, what I really learned, basically, from this volunteering activity was at the end of the process, um, when I was bagging these uh, pieces of meat, making sure that it uh, weighed about one kilo and giving to the people who really needed them. And what I realized, you know, especially for a young boy that was very important, was that you know, um, people who experience poverty come from very diverse backgrounds. And the learning point for me was that um, no act of kindness that we do would ever be too small. Now, many a times we downplay the impact of uh, the actions that we give. We, we, we always badger ourselves. And so this was a kind of lesson for me. And basically, I learned that it's a thought that counts and every little bit makes the difference. So, four years on, um, poverty that I've come to know had hit hard on my middle-income family. So this happened during the aftermath of the uh, Asian financial crisis uh, in 98. So that was when my, uh, my dad suffered a stroke. So he couldn't move and I suddenly became in charge of the house. Um, he had a lot of illnesses. 
um, and you know uh, he was staying in hospital for about uh, he had to go in and out of hospital for about one and a half years so you can imagine the hospital bill chalked up and uh, we, we got a shock when we saw a six-figure hospital bill so he lost his job soon after that and my mom became the sole breadwinner um, and it was very difficult for us to tide over uh, you know, this period because uh, whatever that she brought home was never enough. Once we paid, paid the bills, there was nothing left. Uh, even to pay school fees, to have meals on the table, it was very difficult for us. And um, even we never celebrated birthdays for many, many years. Uh, and, and also during festivals, we never celebrated as well because there was never enough money. So that was when I had to work during the nights. Um, I was working as a kitchen helper for many years um, and this was when I was sitting for my national exams. Um, so I worked just to put food on the table because I think my siblings were also quite small, aged about four and six. So it was a very harsh lesson for me um, and for me that anyone, including myself, could become poor if tragedy hit unexpectedly. So thankfully, with the help of the community, um, they know, we managed to get out of this. But I would say that um, what I did to really come out of, of this poverty situation was that um, I think I learned this word called meritocracy, right? <laughs> so I realized that, hey, you know, I'm in this situation. How do I get myself out? So um, I, 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 kept, I kept looking at all the bursaries and the uh, merit scholarships and whatever. So whatever, um, whatever that my school offered, and as long as there's money, I would work very hard to chalk up my grades and just to get that money and pay my debts. So that was how I learned. Now, fast forwarding to the present, I was reminded about the pain and suffering my family went through during our time of need. And um, I met this, this man, his name is Mr. Salib, right? Um, he, he's a frail 73 year old man. So he knocked on my door uh, at the place where I'm volunteering in my community and it was during the fasting month of Ramadan. Now, the fasting month for the Muslims is, is a period where um, the Muslims would uh, start fasting at about uh, 6 a.m. and then they would break their fast at about 7 p.m., 7-ish. And what happened was um, he knocked my door at 8 and uh, I opened the door and I saw him. He's quite a familiar face because he would you know, ask for help time and again here and there. Uh, but this time I was asking him, hey, you know, what are you here? So. The, the thing was he, was, he was asking me, do you have sugar? So I was like, sugar? I mean, it's 8 p.m. and you're asking me for sugar? So I was just shaking my head. So the thing was this. Mr. Salim was asking for sugar because uh, he explained that he did not have money to, you know, despite uh, fasting for about 12 hours or so, he didn't have money to break fast. He didn't have any food. And he was just asking for sugar to make coffee for him and his wife. Um, so when I asked him, okay, so how about tomorrow breakfast? Then he said, oh... Uh, for us, we live by the day. Uh, so tomorrow is another day, then I would just deal with it. So, you know, it really left me for a heavy heart. So I decided, you know, uh, I, I gave him more than he needed in terms of rations and I gave him some money from my own pocket. So, but I really wanted to know more about the difficulties that he was facing. So I had to sit down with him and uh, ask him what are his problems. And he, and, and, and I think I managed to uncover more. He mentioned that he was basically living in a, um, uh, he, he doesn't have a home, a roof over his head, and he was living in a one-room flat with five to six family members. Uh, and uh, basically, he would live there until his relatives would chase him, out, chase, chase him out, and it doesn't belong to him. And basically, the food that he ate, because he, he cannot cook, he can't cook, so he has to eat all the uh, instant noodles and stuff like that. Very unhealthy. Then he mentioned that he had he has a grandson, so you know, um, and he, he said that his grandson wasn't. A, his grandson is about five to six years old, and you know the boy couldn't go to K one, K two, kindergarten because they don't have money, despite you know paying only about twenty or thirty dollars per month. So, after saying that, um, I thought to myself, you know, this this little boy, uh, Mr. Salim's grandson, if he went to primary school because you know being ill-equipped, um, not having foundation in education. If he moved on uh, and later going on to secondary school, usually uh, cases like him, they would fall out of education and uh, you know, there will be dropouts. And I, I was very worried for him. So it was clear then and then that generational poverty had occurred. Now, because Mr. Salim was a low-income earner, 
his family members, uh, his, his children, uh, all of them were either earning zero or low income. And also, uh, and it has perpetuated for many years. So it occurred that uh, this vicious cycle will continue. And if we don't do anything to help people like him, this, this will just uh, perpetuate. So it is unfortunate that this happens to Mr. Salim. And it is, it is very saddening to know that he lives day by day, not having a roof over his head, as well as you know, thinking, about, uh, put, I mean, thinking about putting food on the table is a constant problem for him. I'm sure there are many others like him. So my first-hand and personal encounters with poverty um, had been a major reason for me to form Voluntary Singapore. Now, Voluntary Singapore is a non-profit and youth volunteer organization established in 2012. Um, we exist to encourage and empower youths to help change our social landscape and make a difference in the lives of people who need help, um, who basically need help the most. We do so by providing volunteering opportunities to all youths, both youths um, who are keen to volunteer on an ad hoc basis as well as a, on the um, uh, long-term basis. And this way, everyone can volunteer their time to help the poor and vulnerable. We also mentor youth volunteer leaders who are keen to make a difference uh, in society. So what they do is they solve community problems. It's, it's, it's usually a two to three month project. Now, back to poverty. So this myth that poverty does not exist has been debunked. So what do you think caused most people to think that poverty does not exist? Well, I think that Singaporeans have a misconception about poverty. Uh, they still think that, you know, uh, to be poor, one has to be living on the streets, one has to wear torn and tattered clothes, and one has to beg for a living and not have belongings like TV, fridge, handphone, etc. Well, this is, a mis this is a common misconception. Now, I have a story. Uh, I had one donor come up to me um, recently and say, Hey, Fahan, you know, I'm going to pledge um, a five-figure sum for you to help the underprivileged. So I asked him, So, Andy, what are your requirements? His requirements, what, what he mentioned, was basically things that um, uh, resemble uh, you know, a third world problem. So basically what I've just mentioned, like living on the streets, uh, not having tiles on the floor, etc. And he, he basically mentioned that if we couldn't find beneficiaries who were needy enough according to his standards, um, then he would bring the money overseas. Now, this is, a, this is a big problem. And it dawned upon me, and it is a realization that our mindset of poverty has to change now because poverty is relative. So poverty still exists, but poverty has evolved. Since Singapore has moved from a third world to first nation, so has its social problem. Now, first world problems are not just a hashtag, right? I mentioned that we have first world problems. I'm glad you got the joke, okay? I'm not very good at telling jokes. Okay. So I mentioned that we have first world problems and that, and of course that doesn't include your phone at home, you know, uh, not being able to buy your branded goods or even not eating at your favorite restaurant. Now, if we, my friends, don't actively help the needy, they may form the social underclass. The low or zero income of parents may lead to a poor start in education for their children. And because of this lack of motivation to study, the kids may drop out and become youths at risk, susceptible to negative influences like shoplifting, drug abuse, joining teen gangs, and the list goes on. These teens will grow up in a negative environment, and the same may repeat for their children. Now, you can play a role. You can step up to help those families break out from the poverty. Um, from the poverty cycle by not just giving them money, not just giving them support, but also giving them your time. Now, what's important is before we help anyone, we need to first understand their needs. What we can do today to help the underprivileged is first to identify the needy in your community. So it could be um, you know, people living in your neighbourhood, near your HDB. Now, if you don't live at the HDB, it could be at the hawker centre. It could also be in your school, um, a cleaner or whatsoever. But please, um, so what you could do is you could refer them to the CC, community center, or the CDCs or whatsoever. Uh, and also maybe you could uh, kind of accompany them to see your local MP.
But before you bring them, please ask them for permission. You need to build a rapport. You can't just drag them like that, all right? Okay, so secondly, what you could do, um, if, if you could join programs to mentor uh, children and youths. For children, it is very meaningful because you would be a sense of, uh, you would be a pillar of strength. Um, you would be a motivation for them because, you see, they do not have positive influences in their life. So if you're there, you're spending time to teach them tuition, um, you are the reason for them to excel in their studies. For the um, teenagers uh, or those who are studying in the IHLs, um, you, would, you would basically um, encourage them to upgrade their skills and uh, upgrade themselves academically. And this goes a very long way to help them um, upward, uh, through the upward social mobility and this will help them to break out the poverty cycle. Now, I hope that I have been, uh, that I've managed to open your eyes to the criticalities and the needs of our community and society. I hope that my talk has somewhat inspired or convinced you to volunteer and make a difference in the lives of the underprivileged. Let's not leave anyone behind in this. We all have to play our part if we want to make Singapore a livable home for everyone. Thank you. <laughs>